All right, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 23, I want to speak to you today on this subject, take your stand. Take your stand. The Bible says in chapter 23, verses 11 and verse 12. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, it'll be on screen. The Bible says, now after him was Shammah. How many have always wanted to name your son Shammah? I didn't think so. The son of A.G. a Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. Now that word lentils is what we would know as peas. So they're in a pea patch. All right, that's what this is centered around, a lentil patch, a pea patch. And the people fled from the Philistines, verse 12. But he took his stand. He took his stand. Sometimes we just got to stand up, guys. Sometimes when nobody else stands, we got to stand. Sometimes we got to stand for our marriage. Sometimes we've got to stand for our relationships. Sometimes we got to stand for the Word of God. Even if nobody else will do it, we need to stand. We need to stand for our church. We need to stand for some things. We're going to talk about those in a few moments. But the Bible says that Shammah took his stand in the midst of the plot of ground, in the midst of the pea patch. He defended it, and he struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. I want to speak to you for the next few minutes today on the subject, take your stand. Now, chapter 23 tells us about David's mighty men. One of his mighty men is a guy by the name of Shammah. Now, Shammah was those guys that stood beside stood beside David, King David. They were kind of like his bodyguards, you know, kind of like our security team here at SoulQuest. Amen? We got them. If you're a first-timer, feel safe. John, there's one. Stand up, John. Don't mess with me. See, we moved him to the front row because some people were looking kind of weird. We, I mean, we got to take care of some fun. Front row. And I promise you, he don't have a bullet in his pocket. It's in the chamber. Don't mess with me while I'm preaching. Amen? So David has some bodyguards. He has some mighty men that stood beside him and stood with him in battle. And here we have a situation where Shammah, one of the bodyguards of David, he had to stand all by himself because nobody else would stand. You see, he's described as a man that took a stand against overwhelming odds. He took a stand when it looked like from the outside in that there's absolutely no way possible Shammah could win this victory. You see, he didn't just fight one or two or three or ten or twelve people. He fought the Philistine army. I don't know if he was a big guy. I don't know if he's a scrawny guy. I don't know if he was bulky or cut up or build. I I don't know what he was, but I do know one thing. The reason he won was not because of Shammah. The reason he won the victory is because the Spirit of God was working through his life. Guys, we can't win victories without God working through us. When we come to that place in our lives where we think we've got it all figured out, yeah, you know, we, we've done this, or I've done this, or this is all good because of me. Man, listen, we're on the wrong path. By the way, when you look around you and see, three years ago, w- this church was started with just a few people, and now we'll have over 300 today, and that's good for a summer in the v- vacation season. God has done some pretty amazing things, but it's not because of me. It's not It's not even because of you, it's because God working through us does what he does. It's not us. It wasn't Shammah, but it was God working through Shammah. Now, let me give you just a a brief background of what's taking place here. The Philistines attacked the people of God. Child of God, I want you to hear me. If you think you're going to give your life to Jesus and then it's going to be smooth sailing for the rest of your life, I got news for you, it ain't going to happen. Tough times will come your way. But if you've got God in your life and the Spirit of God leading you through your life, He's going to help you get through it. And Shammah was up against this battle. The Philistine army came against the people of God, and when they came, the people ran in fear, except for one man. His name was Shammah. 
He had to stand in a pea patch. He protected this pea patch. When everybody else ran, he stood. When everybody else ran, he stood. As I walk down through this passage of Scripture, verses 11 and 12, there's three things that jump out at me. I want you to jot these three things down. Number one, Shammah stood in the midst of battle. He stood in the midst of battle. The Bible says in verse 11, Now after him was Shammah, the son of Aji, a Herite, and the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. Shammah stood in the midst of battle. I want you to notice when the enemy came. This is interesting. When did the enemy come? Well, I want you to think about this. They came during the time of harvest. They were busy. They had their minds on harvesting their crops. The enemy came when they were busy. They were getting their crops in. They were busy working at, and, and they wouldn't be prepared for war because they were busy farming. Well, that's a lesson that we can learn today as a church. Can I remind you of what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8? Be of sober spirit, be on the, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Be on the alert. Can I tell you something? I don't know if you've, you, you've, you've heard this. Well, the devil is real. And if you've lived for Jesus very long, you know he's real. Because he's going to attack you and he's going to try to defeat you. Friend, he is a real person. He's not equal with God, though. He's not God's brother. Like some people think. He's not Jesus' brother. He's not co-equals with God. He's a creation of God. His name was Lucifer. God created him. He was in charge of all of the music, the worship in heaven. He rebelled against God, and God kicked him out of heaven. He became the devil. Lucifer, Slewfoot, and since that time, he brought a third of the angels with him. They're called demons, and they do everything that they possibly can to destroy your life. So he says we need to be of sober spirit. Be on the alert because the enemy is coming. When does he come? When we're busy and we're not alert. Let me show you another passage of Scripture found in Nehemiah chapter 4. Verses 16, 17, and 18. This is a great example of this because Nehemiah, let me give you a little background. Nehemiah was called by God to go back to Jerusalem and build this wall. It had been broken down and he went back. And by the way, when you go do a worthy cause, anything you're doing that's worth something, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have opposition. Man, I, I pastored some churches in my ministry, and I want to be honest with you. Man, I've had some major opposition, and the opposition is not always from outside the, the, the church and out, outside of the body of Christ. Sometimes it's within. Matter of fact, the biggest opposition I've ever had in ministry was within the church. Just because somebody's in church doesn't mean they're a child of God. Hello, drop the So watch this. So here we have Nehemiah, and they're building the wall. And the Bible says in verse 16, From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears. They were working, 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 and they were alert, 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 alert. Because they knew the enemy would come. The shields and the bows and the breastplates and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Verse 17, the Bible says, those who were rebuilding the wall and those who, were carried, uh, those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. They were on the alert. They were on the alert. So I want you to notice something. We can get busy even doing stuff in the church 
in the house of God and we get so focused on what we're doing in the house of God that sometimes we forget there's an enemy that's trying to destroy us and destroy the house of God. we got to be on the alert. So the first thing that I wanted you to see was I wanted you to see when the enemy came. But the second thing I want you to see is why the enemy came. Two reasons. Two reasons. Number one, to, to inflict casualties. Can I tell you, if you're a child of God, the devil wants to kill you. He wants to kill your influence. He wants to kill your reputation. He wants to kill your testimony. The enemy came here to inflict casualties, but also to destroy the crops. Why? They knew, the Philistines knew, that they could wound the enemies and then bring them to hunger. And if they did that, then they could defeat them. Satan is our enemy, and he wants to do these same two things in your life. He wants to discourage you. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to make you anemic and weak. This past week I was in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and uh, we were, I was at the, the camp evangelist for a, a camp that, that they do there every year. And I told the students, it's not rocket science. Can I tell you the same thing? It's not rocket science. we got to stay strong in the Lord. That is, we got to stay in the Word, stay in prayer, stay in church, and live the life of faith. We've got to be ready at all times because the enemy is going to come against us with everything that he's got. And he's going to try to destroy your life. But if you are strong in the Lord and you feed your faith and you starve your fear, then when he comes, you can tell the devil where to go. When the enemy came, why? Why the enemy came? Listen, he doesn't care about... Those that are just going through the motions. Doesn't care about that. I'll tell you who he does care about. He cares about those that are winning souls. The devil wants to destroy those individuals and churches that are reaching people with the gospel. This week, the Southern Baptist Convention is going on somewhere out in Arizona, I guess Phoenix. And I saw a tweet yesterday. And it just blows my mind because I just don't understand what people are doing, but it blows my mind that there are 12 churches every week in the Southern Baptist Convention that close their doors for the very last time. Wow. 12 churches a week in the Southern Baptist Convention that are closing their doors, locking them up, and never going back into them again. What does that mean? That means that we are not passionate about reaching people with the gospel. Man, if we just if churches will just get excited about telling people about Jesus, they won't have to worry about the doors being closed. And the devil doesn't like it. Can I just tell you? The devil does not like Soul Quest Church. He don't like us. You ever been unliked by somebody? I don't care if the devil don't like me. He doesn't like us. We'll see over 100 people saved just this year in this church, baptizing a whole bunch of them because that's what God's called us to do. And when we do that, the devil's not happy. So what he does is he tries to inflict casualties. He tries to destroy the crops. In our case, he tries to destroy souls. Number three, I want you to notice what the enemy found. What did he find? Well, the enemy in this passage of Scripture, the enemy found that there was absolutely no opposition except one man. I can imagine that when they showed up, the Philistine army, and they showed up and they saw little Shammal standing all by himself, they probably started laughing. What's wrong with you people? You won't even stand and fight? You leave one little guy here to fight us? And Shammah took care of business. But he stood all by himself. When Satan tries to stir up trouble in the church, when Satan tries to stir up trouble in your marriage, when Satan tries to stir up trouble in your finances, don't run. Stand up and fight. See, I'm discovering that not a lot of people want to stand. 
God, give us men and women who will stand. God, give us men and women who will stand for the things of God, who will stand for the Bible, who will stand for the church, who will stand for their marriage. No matter what, I'm going to stand. Even when hard times come, I'm going to stand for my marriage. Stand. Number two, not only Shammah took a stand in the midst of battle, but number two, Shammah stood with boldness. I love verse 12. The Bible says, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. He stood with boldness. How did he fight? He fought with boldness. He he fought with courage. He made up his mind that he would stand. He made up his mind that he would fight. We need some men in this place today who will say, I'm going to make up my mind. I'm going to stand, and I'm going to fight for my wife. I'm going to stand, and I'm going to fight for my husband. I'm going to stand, and I'm going to fight for my marriage. Listen, some of you right now in this place, your finances are upside down. you got way more going out than you got coming in, and you don't know what to do. Listen, friend, get to Dave Ramsey Financial Peace tonight. Tonight, right here, and stand for your finances. Stand against the enemy. Take it back. Listen, so many people are just so tired and beat up and they're just ready to quit. Don't quit. Even if you're the only person standing, stand. Stand with boldness. Stand with boldness. How did he fight? He fought with courage and boldness. Why did he fight? Hmm. Shammah knew that some things are worth fighting for. Some things are worth fighting for. You ever, how many of you guys, maybe girls too, but how many of you guys like to fight when you were in school? Come on, be honest. You just picked a fight just to fight. Come on. Only three or four of you? I was something surprised. More than that in the first service. I mean, you just like to fight. How many of you? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you like to fight? How many of you want to fight right now? Let's have a wrestling match. No, I wouldn't. Sometimes just, some things are just worth fighting for. You know, guys are funny because guys will just beat the tar out of each other and then they're best friends the next day. We're crazy that way. Girls, other end, well, that's another story. But you know, guys, I, I, I got two little nephews, Blaine and Jacob. I never will forget when we were in Trenton. We were leaving Trenton to go down to Florida to pastor. We were loading our, the U-Haul up. And they came over to help. And Blaine and Jacob were little at that time. They weren't really helping. And I, I, I walked out the door. And we were about ready to leave. Lori was, my sister was up helping me. Blaine and Jacob were down in the backyard on their knees, just like this, facing each other and exchanging uh, licks in the chest. I mean, just, I mean, just letting it go. Bam! (laughs) They laughed. And then the other one go, bam. I mean, and yet they're best friends the next day. Listen, guys love to fight. Some things are worth fighting for. I've kind of always been a fighter. I, I know some pastor friends of mine that have gone through some hard stuff in their churches, and they say, I just don't want to, I don't, I don't want to pull the church through this thing. And so they just resign. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And let those people win? We're going to stand and fight for what's right. Sometimes you just got to fight. I never will forget this. I said I wasn't going to say it in the second service because we're live on Facebook Live, but I can't help it. I got to do it. I, I was in college. I won't say what college. You can figure that out. But I had a professor. He was my favorite professor because, you see, when I was in college, I, I had a religion major. And um, so all my classes were Old Testament, New Testament, minor prophets, major, you know, major prophets and epistles, different, you know, so you get a lot of biblical knowledge. But there was one class, it was called Practical Pastoring. It's my favorite class because that class we actually learned how to do ministry stuff. I mean, one day we went to Calvary Baptist Church. Well, I just gave it away. We went to Calvary Baptist Church, the whole class did, and we baptized each other. It was fun. I, I love that class. But, but I love the professor more than anything. I only had him for one class, but I had him for this class. And I, I never will forget one day we were in class and it Probably wasn't, uh, the material that day probably wasn't the most interesting of all days, but all of a sudden, my professor started telling this story about how he was the interim pastor at a church, and, 
And this deacon, don't you love him? Every time he preached, this guy came up to him and was letting him have it and bashing him and telling him, you know, that ain't what the Bible says, and just giving him a hard time every time he preached. So finally, one day, he was at the, down in front of the, uh, the Lord's Supper table, and people were coming by, and he was shaking their hands. He looked up, and here he comes. And he goes, oh, here he comes again. And so he got down there, and sure enough, same thing, same song and dance. He starts b- blasting him and telling him, you know, you're leading our church in the wrong direction and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, this professor of mine, who's the interim pastor of this church, he had had all he could take. Now, he's telling all these young, impressionable preacher boys the story. He just stops, looks down, and starts rolling his sleeves up. The guy looks back, he said, what are you doing? Because I don't cuss in church. He said, I'm getting ready to kick your... I almost like that, and y'all would have said that. <laughs> I forgot where I'm at, I'm in Soul Quest Church. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to kick... No! Oh! He told me, he told the whole class after he did that, that guy backed down, bowed down, humbled down. He became one of his closest friends. Sometimes you just got to fight for what's right. Sometimes, listen, men, listen, the devil's trying to destroy your marriage relationship. Stand up and fight, brother. The devil's trying to destroy your life, your relationship with God, your marriage. Stand up and fight. Sometimes you just got to fight. And so here we have Shammah. He's fighting. He stood with boldness. Why did he do it? Because sometimes it's worth it to fight. Fight for what? Fight for the church. Defend your church. We're not immune to this. We got a special kind of church here. I love you guys so much. And we're, we're a different kind of church. And, but we're I couldn't wait to get home this week and to stand on this platform and preach to you guys. We've been the last eight, six days, seven days, we've been in Arkansas and Kentucky preaching, and we've seen a bunch of people get saved and lives have been changed, but there's nothing quite like being back and preaching at Soul Quest. I love it here. But we're not immune to stuff because we're humans. We're not immune to gossip. You get in the flesh, you may start saying things, and well, I don't like the way they do that, or they, he, I don't like him, or I don't like her. Listen, when you hear somebody gossiping about your church, stand up for your church. I mean, we need to stand up for our church. We need to stand up for the lost. We need to stand up for the Word of God. We need to stand up for old-fashioned preaching and old-fashioned praying and praising and holiness and our reputation and our testimony, our families, our marriage, our children, our youth. Listen, friend, there are some things that are worth fighting for. Shammah stood, and he stood with boldness. But then number three, and I close with this, Shammah stood until God brought the beat down. Yeah, God brought the beat down. God won the victory. You see, the Lord defeated the enemy. The Lord defeated the enemy. Listen, God is the one who wins the victory. Not me, not you. It's God who wins the victory. He gave Shammah the ability to stand. Shammah had a sword in his hand, but God fought the battle. He had a sword in his hand, but God fought the battle. You can look at example after example after example. In the Word of God, you've got David and Goliath. There ain't no way that David, little puny David, could beat a nine-foot, six-inch giant. But he did. He stood with boldness, with courage, and God brought the victory. All throughout the Word of God, you can read it. Daniel stood. God won the victory. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood. God won the victory. You see, the people in your life need you to stand. You need you to stand. Because one man was willing to stand, God protected the people, and 
They were saved from starvation and they were saved from slavery. If we don't stand, Satan will certainly take things away. Let me ask you something as the music plays softly. Let me ask you something. Where's your pea patch? Where's your pea patch? Where's the opposition coming from in your life? Is it your marriage? Is it your family? Is the devil trying to destroy you, your life, your health, your emotions, your mind? Is the devil attacking your occupation? Is he attacking your church? Is he trying to destroy your family? You know what we need today? We need men and women to get off the bench and stand. Stand. Even if that means standing by ourselves, stand. Stand. Don't run, don't flee, but stand. Sir, it's time to fight for your marriage. It's time to fight for your spiritual walk. Fight for your health. Fight. Stand. Don't sit down, don't whip her down, don't quit, but stand and fight. My friend, listen to me, listen to me. Before you can stand, you've got to first of all kneel. Because you can't stand until you've kneeled.